Hello and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Caroline Mandler, the Executive Director of Wilton Library. So on behalf of everyone here, I would like to welcome you all to the first program in our annual scholarly lecture series. For 16 years, Wilton Library and the Wilton Historical Society have partnered to present this series spanning a wide range of historical topics. This year, the theme is A Rocky Road, the Struggle for Rights in America. And we look forward to exploring this topic as a community in this four-part series over the next two months. You can check our website for all of the upcoming dates. Thank you to all of our donors who support our collections and programs, and especially to Kathleen and Bill Brennan, who are the sponsors of this program today. Thank you. So thank you again for joining us. If you could all turn off your electronic devices, we would appreciate it. And I will now turn things over to our moderator, Steve Hudspeth. Thank you very much, Caroline. And to Kathleen and Bill Brennan, many, many thanks. I join Carolyn and expressing special appreciation to you. You've been such faithful sponsors for so many years, and especially sponsoring Janice Adams, who is a favorite daughter of Wilton, <laughs> having lived here for a number of years, and during 16 years of that, having written a very popular column for the Wilton Bulletin. You went on from there to a national stage in which you have made African-American history prominent and important, as have many others. But you have been a very, very special voice that has extended not just to adults, but also to children. Your backpack series, the mentoring programs, the books you've provided, they all speak to an audience that extends across all ages. And what you've accomplished in your life, if I tried to list it all, honestly, <laughs> I'd be here much too long and be standing in the way of you're doing all the special things you do, but I will highlight about a half dozen of them. You were one of the founders of NPR's New York News Bureau, which is a big accomplishment. You have national recognition as a columnist. You have appeared repeatedly on all the major network news programs and also on everything from MS, MSNBC, CNN, to Fox. So you're everywhere. And you've also written three highly acclaimed books. And one of them, Glory Days, I believe are, we have extra copies out there if anybody who has not already read it would like to get one. So with all of that, let me say a special thank you to Janice for being her. Her work not only deals with the broad, but also with more narrow subjects. She has created the Institute for History and Healing that is in the process of developing a site just across the border in New York State that was a plantation populated by a number of enslaved people whose burial site is believed to be, of course, not marked, but on those grounds. Her plan is to develop that site to make it a conference center as well as a research center for African-American history and most of all for healing of the racial divide in our country. 400 years, many of them very terrible, require racial healing. And there's nobody better able to do that than Janice Adams. We're so grateful to have her here today. Thank you, Janice, for honoring us with your presence. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. I am, I am, Thank you, Wilton. Come on. Thank you. Um, I, Steve was so kind in that introduction, and um, he mentioned my backpack series. Yes, I launched what became the first National Book Club for African American History. They were both launched here in Wilton. So thank you, Wilton. Um, yes, they were. And I, I usually say I launched, I um, birthed 
well, raised two companies and two children here, and I can't tell you the number of sniffles that I went through with each of them, so. <laughs> um, I am, this is, uh, now I have on glasses, I can see friends and people that, <laughs> that I've known, and I keep asking, is that Dave Brubeck's piano? Um, I did know him, and um, the last time I saw him, he was playing it, so I am wondering if that is it. Anyway, thank you. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. Turn me round, turn me round, ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. Keep on a walking, keep on a talking, walking down the freedom trail. In this world, said my grandmother, all things are one. The gifts we are given are gifts for the common good. So we must walk the walk, talk the talk, live the life that is ours. In this world too, said my grandfather, let no one contaminate your mind. Come, come, come let me tell you a story I would hear my grandmother call when I seemed in need of a little soothing. Each story, no matter its filigree, would have the same moral, the same reason for being, to share her philosophy of life. Come, come, come let me tell you a story, a story of the history, the herstory that has brought us to this day. Only yesterday, 59 years, four months and 29 years ago, that is, August 28th, 1963, I was on a bus headed to the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. 59 years, five months, and a day ago, my aunt put the finishing touches on a pink and white gingham dress, albeit a sophisticated one, specially made for that momentous day. With it was a matching scarf I'd, turn, I'd tie over a twist of braids as long and thick as questions of race. My mom and I left home in the Bronx at 3 a.m. for the drive to Harlem, where we parked our car, then boarded a chartered bus for D.C. that Wednesday morning. An organizer welcomed us, inducting us for the trip ahead. It would be, he said, a day from which there was no turning back. Within hours, I knew why my parents had always resisted venturing south by car or bus, traveling by train. We'd sped past the blood-soaked soil of the northern south, Maryland and Delaware, past signs colored and white, past trees sagged low with the strange fruit of the lynched. By train, we'd bypass the pain for the promise of Washington's for the promise Washington's architecture evokes, monuments to American freedom built by Africans enslaved. A northern school desegregation pioneer at eight, this was not my first bout with racism, but that bus ride south was my first time violently denied a restroom or food we could afford to buy. It was my first time being stormed by screaming hordes as sheriff's deputies stood idly by. We on the bus were outside agitators disrupting their way of life. The screamers were Americans, citizens defending their rights. We said they were troublemakers. It was 1963. The freedom rides were current events then, not history. Those who attacked our bus on the Delaware-Maryland border, that infamous Mason-Dixon line rocking it from side to side, intended no lullaby. Lumbering into Washington just before 11, our bus emerged from the raging flames of hatred, underscoring the need for the march, into the swarm of a cheering throng. So embraced, we in turn welcomed the next bus. They then cheered the group on after them and on and on. How we got over, the hymn is sung. My soul looks back in wonder how we got over. 
Journeying from up south or down north, we traveled a treacherous route, fought the same demons and fears, and we'd made it true, made it through. School desegregation had been a lonely affair, just one of four little foot soldiers for justice against an army of unapologetic evil I'd been. Getting off the bus in Washington, I came to a mighty awakening. I was not alone. We were not alone. By bus, by train, by plane, people of every hue kept coming. Some walked hundreds of miles to get to that day. For hours, speakers and singers, drum majors all, kept a steady beat until the time finally came for Dr. King to ascend the podium. His familiar baritone tuned like none other, he soothed us, railed us, rallied us, regaled us, commended us on to heights untold. And when he raised his hand over the crowd, invoking his dream, I felt myself levitate soar. One among 250,000 united, I understood the movement and this country as never before. I'd begun the day an innocent in braids and a brand new sundress of pink and white. I would never wear that dress again or braid my hair that way. Little wonder FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover called Nobel Peace Prize Laureate Dr. King the most dangerous man in America. We were all dangerous that day. It was dangerous to threaten and enforce doctrines of white supremacy, dangerous to meet that demon face to face, yet keep on, keeping on our chartered route. That was the promise and the pre premise of the civil rights era. So why do I begin a talk about Reconstruction with the March on Washington? And what was Reconstruction? As defined by historiographers, Re Reconstruction begins 1863 with uh, Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation issuing that, and it ends in 1877. And I do really have notes here that explain Reconstruction and its derailment, which we can further discuss during the Q&A if you'd like. The, that 14-year stretch theoretically is divided into three periods. We can talk about that. But the problem with any such analysis is that it elevates a top-down theoretical perspective over the reality of what was done to people's lives. In sum, Reconstruction, as historian Eric Fona has written in his book, Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution, 1863 to 1877, the war destroyed the institution of slavery, ensured the survival of the Union, and set in motion economic and political changes that laid the foundation for the modern nation. During Reconstruction, the United States made its first attempt to build an egalitarian society on the ashes of slavery. But as defined by one black Louisianian and understood and lived experience by black people, Every state, Reconstruction meant that every state in the South had gotten into the hands of the very men that had held us enslaved. Reconstruction failed as it began, with the people calling the shots being those least likely to take the bullet. With the people enacting compromises, like the Compromise of 1877 that ended Reconstruction with those people using other people's lives as bargaining chips. Or as it was said in the South at the height of segregation during that civil rights era, it happened and was derailed because politics is thoroughly delightful sport. And that's a direct quote. 
And so I begin this talk with the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom because it marked a turning point in American history when black people, joined by people of conscious, conscience of every race, came together from every corner of the nation to say, we may not be able to vote, we may not have a seat at the table, but we are making a way out of no way, as it's said in black culture, the only way we can to say after 246 years of enslavement and 100 plus years of failed promises, enough is enough. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round was the mantra. Keep on a walking, keep on a talking walking up the freedom trail. That was the message of the movement so relevant today. But what I couldn't have imagined only yesterday, those 60 years ago come August, is how much and how little would change. The stereotypically sadistic Southern sheriffs then, the Northern police killings and brutality of innocents today, the screamers who rock the buses then, the Take Back America madmen of Charlottesville and January 6th today, the sundown towns of Reconstruction and its aftermath. The sickness that murdered and maimed Emmett Till and exonerated his murderer then, the exoneration of the murderers of Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Sandra Brown, Eric Garner, Elijah McClain, Alton Sterling, and on and on, to be sure with this, this week's headlines. There may be a measure, yes, for George Floyd and Tyree Nichols, but let us put things in perspective. Added to the one, more than 100 million lives devoured by slavery in America, in recent years, the number of black people killed by police each week, on average, nearly triples the number of black people lynched under mob rule at the height of segregation. And I'm gonna say that again because when I realized it, it absolutely, yes, blew my mind. The number of people on average killed by police today, unarmed people, like Tyree Nichols, killed by police today is on average triple the number of people lynched, excuse me, I said each week is what I meant. The number of black people killed, unarmed black people killed each week is on average nearly triple the number of black people lynched per week under mob rule at the height of segregation. That's what's going on in America today a state-sponsored reign of terror enacted to enforce then as now a pretense of white supremacy. The voting rights we marched for then, the voting uh, voter ID and gerrymandering siege against voting rights now, the election and fraudulent removal of every black elected official from office after reconstruction. The lost cause curriculum exported by the Daughters of the Confederacy to the schools nationwide then, the attacks on the 1619 Project, the misrepresentation of what critical race theory is, book bans and censorship imposed by 14 Republican-led states now, among them Florida, their Governor DeSantis's Stop Woke Act, that touched off last week's headlines about the ban on an, on an AP African-American course as lacking in value, all of that is of a piece. Still today, I remember Dr. King, the dream and the vow he made that March on Washington Day. He said, we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. 
My grandfather took his daughters to march against lynching. My mother took me to march on Washington. My daughter took my granddaughter to march for Trayvon. I linked arms with my daughters and granddaughters in spirit to march against the state-sponsored murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. All of that was the power and the passion poured into me and tended for the journey by my family. All of that is the power and the passion we, we as a family continue to pour in to our daughters. It's a matter of survival. As people of conscience, we take our children where we must. So nurtured, fortified by the dream and the vow, we tend trickling waters in preparation for the stream. All my life, I've been touched by history. A child of the civil rights era, I've lived the sting of current events. A journalist, I've chronicled our collective path. A historian, I've put those events into perspective, into context of time and journeys and destinies, and known the power of history to cleanse and to heal. I was 10 when I met Dr. King at New York's Riverside Church. Because my aunt was a member of that church's professional choir, I had a front row seat when Dr. King spoke there, newly returned from the wars of Montgomery, where Rosa Parks had kept her historic seat and a battalion of everyday people rose to the occasion by taking to their feet maintaining a 585-day boycott that would launch the modern civil rights era, the fight for human rights in America that persists to this day, that actually frames this lecture series that you're having. I met Dr. King on the receiving line. And what are you doing for our people, he said. Someone had obviously primed him as to who my cousin and I were. But I told him that we were, we and two others had desegregated New York City schools. He told me that what I was doing was important. He then lifted my chin, awestruck as I was, and called me pretty. Growing up a child of the integration generation in those days when pretty and important were about as good as a Negro girl could hope to feel, you could say I was raised by Dr. King. The next day, as my mother and father readied me for school, I saw a different me in the mirror. At eight years old, northern white parents had spat on me and torn my clothes for trespassing what they saw as turf and I saw as school. Now, touched by Dr. King, I felt cleansed, lifted. I was a child raised by Dr. King. His words liberated me and made me feel what every person, man, woman, child, wants to feel, validated, heard, understood. That brief act of caring and generosity was also a charge, a gift of spirit for me to share with people I meet. That moment, that charge that Dr. King gave a then 10-year-old girl is the gift of spirit I share with audiences everywhere I go, with you today. In this world, said my grandmother, all things are one. In this world, said my grandfather, let no one contaminate your mind. That is why we must have the conversations like the one we're having today and will have during the Q&A. Why we look back on our history, ask our questions, and find ways to heal ourselves is because knowledge empowers. As Carter G. Woodson wrote nearly a century ago in his landmark book, The Miseducation of the Negro, and he was referring to that era immediately after the Civil War, Reconstruction, and on um, into the era of slavery, he said, starting out after the Civil War, the opponents of freedom and social justice decided, and he actually used that term at that point, social justice. It's not a new term. He said, the opponents of freedom and social justice decided to work out a program which would enslave the Negroes' minds inasmuch as the freedom of body had to be conceded. 
It was well understood that if by teaching, by the teaching of history, the white man could be further assured of his superiority and the Negro could be made to feel that he had always been a failure and that the subjugation of his will to some other race is necessary, the problem of holding the Negro down was easily solved. But as significant as this iconic statement of America's educational system and mindset remains, the impact of this miseducation on all Americans is better addressed in a lesser known quote, particularly relevant in this era. The lynchings then, the police killings of innocents now, the ongoing miseducation of every American today. Woodson writes, this crusade for knowledge and educational justice is much more important than the anti-lynching movement because there would be no lynching if it did not start in the classroom. The schoolroom, our libraries, our historical societies, many of which around the country right now are currently under attack, driven by so-called anti-CRT mania or ruse. So I thank you, Wilton Library and the Wilton Historical Society for this and other upcoming events. Thank you for your sponsorship. It's important, and some might even say in these difficult days, courageous. Because a knowledge of history is the, healing, the, is the key to healing ourselves and others. Come, come, come let me tell you a story I would hear my grandmother call. Come, come, come let me tell you a story, a story of the history, the history that has brought us together today. Praise the bridge that carries you over, the old folks say. Go down to the river, cross over to the other side. Praise the bridge, no matter how rough the ride. Traveling our own stretch of the freedom road, who among us hasn't grown weary at times? How we got over, that song is sung. How will we get over, we wonder. The voices of the ancestors echo around us. Go to the bridge. For history is like a traveler's diary, surveying all we have seen and done and where we have been and what has become of us as we press along life's route. Those who have come before us have faced the same crossroads we now face. Many of the same treacherous twists in the road, but we, being together here today, are proof of their success. We are here today because they never lost hope, never gave up on the journey, never lost sight of the, def of the destination, never confused trouble with the gift of another day. How can you know how to get where you're going till you know how you've got where you've been? <laughs> Travel on and study the route. At the bend of the river, sound the depth. At the crossroads, Look to the signpost state along the way. Such is the method and message of my books. Thank you, Steve, for mentioning that. Glory Days, Inspired Moments in African American History. Freedom Days, Inspired Moments in Civil Rights History. Sister Days, 365 Inspired Moments in African American Women's History. 365 markers along the road days of challenge and choice, the choice to wind a trail to freedom, and what a journey it has been. African Americans, people of conscience, as I say, of every hue, faith, and imagination, have kept our eyes on the prize and held on. In a landscape filled with, mine, with landmines, African Americans still dare a frustrating maze of history, yet, we are here, standing on the bridge, crossing over our River Jordan, and pushing on to the other side. Yet, in business, in science and technology, in the arts, in education, in every field of endeavor, there is cause to celebrate, to praise our bridges and how we got over. 
on the lecture trail asked to speak about history and victory. Brown was really just one of the many junctures, but indeed, civil rights history is quite broad, and often I don't get to discuss it that way. And though framed, though often seen as framed by Brown v. Board of Education, the decision of May 17, 1954, on one side, the civil rights era, and the April 4, 1968 assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, ending that period, more importantly, it reaches quite beyond the bounds of politics to make it to what makes it all worthwhile, the laughter, the love, the joy. To crop scenes from its rich canvas sets the movement out of context, denying black people our full humanity and our continuity of experience from 1619 to this very day, and that continuity with the pan-African world. For the miracles we have performed did not end with the pyramids of Thebes or the great Zimbabwe, the world's first and oldest university, which is on the African continent, al Karouin at Fez, Morocco, or the 14th century manuscripts written in Arabic and preserved in Timbuktu, Mali, West Africa. From this period that we are talking about, Mrs. Bethune, Mary McLeod Bethune, who became an advisor to the Roosevelt's, Roosevelt's too, Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. She built a college with what she said, $1.50, six little girls, her faith in God, and a recipe for sweet potato pie. And the assets enumerated in her last will and testament, which included, I give you love, and I give you hope. At the depths of oppression, Duke Ellington made folks jump for joy. Even in its purest political expression, the civil rights movement was one part of the global quest for self-determination by people of African descent, in particular relation to the African-American experience and by peoples of color of every nation as related to the global crusade for human rights an independent rule. It was a goal made tangible and viable when Ethiopia's Emperor Haile Selassie mounted the podium of the League of Nations in 1936, when Jesse Owens won four gold medals at the Olympics that same year, and later when the world's peoples of color gathered for the Great Bandung Conference of 1955 in China. It is a process of symbiotic healing and resurrection in which the challenges and triumphs of one region inspire and support another. Whether throwing off the, the yoke of colonization or slavery, apartheid or segregation, the mission is the same, self-empowerment, self-determination. The turning point in this period, 1865, to 1968 comes in the pivotal years of 1936 to 1968 when the prism of electric electronic technology not our digital technology but the electric the electronic revolution radio news newsreels television when that intensifies the look and sound of freedom and the hypocrisy of the vision that is freedom denied that black women founded their Freedom Female Literary Association of Philadelphia, holding their first mental feast on September 20th, 1831. And remember here that I said 1831, publishing their constitution in the Liberator, an abolitionist an abolitionist newspaper on December 3rd, 1831, spreading their message and mission to New York, Providence, Hartford, Boston, and beyond, and founding quiet as it's kept, the women's movement in America. African-American women founded the women's movement in America. Let us remember that when we speak of Seneca Falls, we're talking 1848. Okay? Quiet as it's kept. 
that purchasing the real McCoy, the best there was in railroad engineering and its ancillary products, was the work of an African-American engineer, Elijah McCoy, who patented the first self-lubricating engine on January 12, 1872. That the, let us remember that the National Steamship Company was incorporated in January 1895. By March 3rd, 1895, its excursion steamboat, the George Leary, was launched. Completely state of the art, this side wheeler was 272 feet long, I'm always amazed at this, with three decks, 64 staterooms, 100 berths, and a dining room, and at the time, at a time when electricity meant luxury even in the wealthiest of homes, the George Leary was completely electrified. Most importantly, it provided a capacity crowd of 1,500 Afri African American passengers with peaceful, respectful service on its regular route between Washington, D.C. and Norfolk, Virginia. We remember, too, that once permitted to stake their rightful claims on the law, Miriam E. Benjamin, patent number 386286, invented a gong and single signal chair in 1888. Reconstruction. Her design was adapted by the U.S. House of Representatives, what a mistake she made, so that the members of Congress could call their pages while in session. Sarah Boone, patent number 473653, invented the ironing board in 1892. Before her invention, with its padded cover and collapsible legs, wooden boards were stretched across the backs of two chairs to make an ironing table. Sarah Good, I'm deliberately mentioning women here because I've already mentioned Elijah McCoy, and we don't normally mention women. Um, but Sarah Good, patent number 322177, invented the folding cabinet bed in 1885, and her invention provided the original concept for the hideaway bed. And Sarah Breedlove Walker, later better known as Madam C.J. Walker, leveraged her hot straightening comb and conditioning compounds to make her African America's first self-made woman millionaire. On July 28, 1917, as silent marchers paraded Harlem streets, carrying banners inscribed with, as they said, in prepar as they said in their preparatory meetings, our loyalty through our whole history in this culture and the brutality which has been practiced in return. Madam, yet, African Americans have seen themselves as Americans first. Madam C.J. Walker used her extraordinary wealth to fund anti-lynching campaigns. And it, so it is against this backdrop that I have come to see the faces of young and old, black and white, of people hungry for answers, craving direction. I wonder where the promise of a former era went and where it will take us. Where has the hope of the African American freedom movement gone, much like the end of Reconstruction being derailed. It's important, I don't think I mentioned it, but this is actually considered the period of the third Reconstruction. The first Reconstruction being the one 1865 to 1877. The second Reconstruction being that civil rights era. The third Reconstruction right now with the pushback against the progress of the past 50 years. And the question becomes, which way will America turn? Something else uh, I'm gonna mention just uh, quickly as an aside is that one of the things that you don't know unless, or you don't notice, unless you really look at the African-American history, the history of people usually expunged from the records of American history, 
is that there's a pattern to American history. Always in the 60s, there's a flourishing and a ratcheting up of the call for freedom. Always in the 90s, there's a downturn. 1660s is it happens with the Christiana Revolt. 1690s, you have the first fugitive slave law. 1750s and 60s, that's the period that Colonial Williamsburg is memorializing and celebrating. And you see everybody there in Colonial Williamsburg talking about the freedom and what's gonna happen, and they don't know there's a revolution yet, but they know that something's happening for freedom. By the 1790s, you have the Constitution with the three-fifths clause, and you have um, the betrayal of African-American soldiers, and you have another fugitive slave law. 1850s and 60s, freedom once again, civil war. 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson. And you have the institutionalization of a reign of terror called segregation. 1950s and 60s again, we have this ratcheting up of freedom, and by the 60s and is the civil rights movement, and the civil rights movement leads to the women's movement, and the, the, um, even the Gray Panthers uh, take their call from, from that period of time. By the 1990s, you have the downturn again with the pushback against affirmative action and the Bakke decisions and all of that. What throws it off course, I truly believe, is the internet and the democratization of information. But once we have the election of 2008, the election of Barack Hussein Obama, that is what puts it back on course in terms of the pushback and the vitriol. And we are going once again through what we've gone through in this cycle for 400 years. That said, how many people will know that or do know that every positive development for blacks has improved this nation as a whole? In this political climate, few are going to be willing to say so. How many realize that the push for black voting rights ended the poll tax and disfranchisement of poor whites? Or that the civil rights and black power movements forged affirmative action most prominently for white women? The oneness of the human experience focused through the lens of, Afri of the African-American sojourn, these stories our story of our history, of our healing, of our hope, of love, of remembrance, and they are a celebration of life. Ain't gonna let nobody turn us around. Keep on a walking, keep on a talking, walking down the freedom trail. How we got over. Yes, the song is sung. How we got over. My soul looks back in wonder how he got over. Dr. King said the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice, hence the title of this lecture. How did we get over? We did it step by step, day by day, person to person, bending the arc. For centuries, African Americans have been demeaned as slaves as though the shame of those who would enslave us could take the measure of our lives. We have been segregated and villainized as though the blindness of those who would mock us could share the vision of all we survey. We have known the depths of despair, yet we have lifted ourselves up and our world up through the legacies of our past and the promise of our future. We have infused our world with the wonder of all our greatest days. And the fruits of those vast achievements re renew our spirits, energizing and empowering our climb 
toward better worlds for ourselves and others. Congratulations, yes, to African Americans, for we are the sons and daughters of Africa in America. Congratulations to all the sons and daughters of Europe, of Asia, throughout the Americas, to people of every faith, imagination, and orientation here today. Do you know what a proud legacy of commitment and conscience is yours to own and share? This little light of mine, I say, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I say to you, we're gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. And I'm gonna ask you to sing it with me because it's about all of us. Everywhere we go, we're gonna let it shine. Yes, everywhere we go, we're gonna let it shine. Everywhere we go, we're gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I thank you for being here today. so that those on camera. Is this live? That is live, and uh, the camera is aimed right here, though. All right, so I'm supposed to speak on this one, and you're supposed to speak on that one. And this one is kind of live. I guess it is, right? I'm going to do the old-fashioned way. I now have a bench. <laughs> oh, that's very cool. <laughs> I get to rest. Okay, I won't promise not to get too close to the speaker, and you'll remind me if I do, because you're going to get a lot of feedback. You won't like that. Okay. Okay. I'm going to ask if there are questions. I bet there are. Yes. Put it, sir, right down there, and we're going to get you a microphone. Michael's coming with it right now. Um, we had the Supreme Court, um, six of whose members are in Placably. I'm, I'm going to ask you to, to just speak more directly. I'm it. sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry well, about that. With a Supreme Court that's implacably opposed to um, progress for African Americans, one of whose members is himself an African American, and one of our two political parties increasingly crazy, <laughs> um, are you optimistic about? The future? Um, I'm going to answer that in two ways. One is that I think we were all raised to put a lot of faith in the Supreme Court of the United States, and we look at it as a beacon, you know, of justice. But when you really look at the decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court, you will see that it is less an an arbiter of right and wrong than a barometer of prevailing political winds. And that is what we have here now. Um, so the, I mean, I'm not optimistic about the Supreme Court, but I am op optimistic about those of us who are people of conscience and commitment who are going to have to goad the Supreme Court and other, as people did, frankly, in the last election, 
not as successful as I wish we'd been, but more successful than they thought we were going to be, um, to do the right thing. Uh, Dr. King made the distinction between right laws and wrong laws, uh, and unjust laws, as he used the term. He said that a, that a good law is one that kind of affects everybody who's in a certain circumstance altogether. It's, it's all of us in it together. An unjust law is one that is a law imposed on certain people by the will of other people, and the other people will not have to live under the law they impose. That, I think, is, is what's happening in the Supreme Court in many ways. Um, in the government in many ways. And um, at some point, people have to remember the basics. There's really only one law that's needed, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And frankly, you've got the rest covered if you've got that. I believe there was a question. Maybe we already got your question, ma'am. Oh. Thank you for your lecture, Dr. Adams. Um, I'm sorry, I, I can't. I wonder if you know whether any committees have been set up to change the sort of textbooks that are being used in schools to show a more accurate view of the history, such as evidence of the Tulsa riots and so on, which have obviously been excluded in the past. Uh, the the question is whether textbooks yeah. that your experience are being changed to reflect, in fact, African American history. The opportunity—it's—it's it's interesting because I mentioned the Daughters of the Confederacy curriculum uh, that was actually thought of and begun at the end of the 19th century to rehabilitate the South and brought out by 1914 and then spread in 1919 to states across the South and then really because of the, of publishing as an industry is how it ended up spreading nationwide because the, the economics of publishing are such that the publishers, especially of hardcover textbooks, um, they decided to opt for the least resistance, and published books that could therefore go to all the states. And therefore, in textbooks, that's why, I forget race for just a moment, but that's why so many textbooks did not mention evolution, okay, because of that kind of thing. The potential is there now with digitized publishing, with um, to be able to do that. The question is whether or not the publishers are going to do that because even though the potential is there for it, um, it does present what people not thinking of things the right way will consider um, economies of scale still for which ways they're written. And so just the way we have, I'm, I'm certainly not advocating, and I don't even think I should have to say that, for people as they're doing in certain places to be gun-toting into libraries and schools saying which books you can have and which you can't. But I will say that just the way certain people are advocating to say we don't want these books, other people have to advocate to say we do want these books. And, we, and just the way some are insisting, I mean, it's insane that we have a situation where a few knuckleheads can go in and say they don't want these books and therefore you can't have the books. That supposedly is, is a violation of the Constitution and yet it's being legislated in very crafty ways right now, like the AP uh, scandal of this past week. Because essentially, if you read the law, I, I actually have it with me, but if you read the law that Ron DeSantis put into, um, enacted last year, actually, his so-called Stop Woke Act, which is disgraceful. Um, I mean, Harvard graduate should find a better word than that to use uh, at the very least. But anyway, 
that act is so manipulative in terms of the way, way it's framed in order to, to then trigger making something like an AP uh, course in African American studies illegal. Because in the law, it has a, one clause that says that any thing that makes certain people feel badly, uh, feel, feel bad about the actions of people like them who lived in the past cannot be taught. Well, you know, I mean, I'm a black person, join the club. Maybe if we all feel bad, we'll stop it and go to something more positive. But that's really, that's in the law right now, okay? And based on that, then it triggered saying that the um, AP course was historically inaccurate and had no educational value. But it's being put into place against the rubric of this. I, I want to say as well on that, that it kind of reminds us of the McCarthy era. Even if we're not involved in, in this current school era with what's going on, think about your knowledge of the McCarthy era. In, under McCarthyism, it was just the norm to just say so and so, um, such and such is, communi is communistic and communist inspired. So the entire <laughs> communism, it comes about from the late 1800s into the um, Russian Revolution and com communism. I kind of think the mistreatment of black people goes back to 1619. And yet, under the era of McCarthy, they defined anybody who protested the mistreatment of blacks, communist. Bec and then, by definition, since they said that anything of that nature was communist, then they were considered, by that definition, um, communist sympathizers, and that opened the grounds for them to be indicted and um, uh, really terrorized on the McCarthy Act and, and the House on American Activities Committee. So we have to understand how these things all interrelate and how the patterns are being used to, to repeat themselves and therefore act accordingly because we know as opposed to acting as though it's a surprise and we didn't know. There's a question right up front here. Janice, I'm gonna take this away from Always embarrassed as hell when I, I grab a microphone. Um, I know I know of you before this afternoon. I now know more, and I'm encouraged to know even more. To go to the statement that I will paraphrase, you don't know where you're going unless you, until you know where you've been. How are you going to know how to get where you're going, going until you know how you got where you you've are. been? Yes, exactly. I've, Thank you. I've done um, con a concert around that. <laughs> how many audiences of students and educators do you get the opportunity, or do they get the opportunity to listen to you? Hal and I, and I look around at so many people I know in this room, have made impacts, we hope, on our community and raised children that will continue to do so. Um, but it's the younger people that need to get educated on this to continue to make a motion forward. Are there initiatives in which you are involved or in which that is taking place? Tell me the last question. Yes, the, the question is basically, in reaching out to our young people, what, what initiatives are you aware of that are carrying the message that you've described? Um, I, I think, you know, I mean, thank you. First of all, thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Um, I have a hard time hearing with, with the, okay. Um, I, I think that there are people who are saying it, but there are risks and dangers. And we are really going to have to be very, very careful um, the, the, uh, about what it means to speak. One of, you know, one of the things that I did not mention in this, I, I said, and it's true, that both my children's um, 
company backpacks and, and those materials, which, which are anti-racist materials, um, and my Harambe book club were both started here in Wilton. What ultimately started the Harambe book, or what made me take that down, were the death threats that I was getting nationwide. That house, the one that Nick and I were talking about, had to be turned into a virtual fortress with driveway signals going off. Uh, we had signals at the edge of the driveway so that if you even breathed, we didn't have a, a fence because that signaled something else on a block where nobody else had fences. So we had um, a signal that went off at the edge of the driveway. Every single door and window, 60 doors and windows, had to all be done. There are risks. And um, that said, we have people making the point with the Black Lives Matter demonstrations. We have people with, with what happened with Tyree uh, Nichols. We had people out there this weekend saying, we, we, we want, what did John Lewis call it? We want to create good trouble here. We've got to have good trouble and talk about what happened that created that situation where five police officers beat a man to death, um, thinking they had impunity. So I, I think that's happening. From a more rigorous, rigorous standpoint in terms of information, it's happening less and less and being endangered more because teachers are now in fr afraid of intimidation. You have Virginia having uh, enacted a, a tip line under the new governor to um, call in and say you think your teacher is teaching something inappropriate. The whole CRT thing, I knew Derek Bell, who was the man who created critical race theory. They are not talking about what he created at all. He was a man, in fact, I want to talk about Derek Bell very, very quickly because it, it's something that people should know. Derek Bell was an attorney a civil rights attorney who was so revered that he was ultimately invited to join Harvard Law School's curriculum. And in, you have Merle Evers, the wife of Medgar Evers, who was murdered. Um, she is talking, you have um, statements where Merle Evers spoke about the security she felt after that when Derek Bell came and slept on their floor even just to watch out over the family after Medgar Evers had been killed and stuff like that and, and his participation at using his, his law background for human rights. And when he gets to Harvard, he notices that, and attorneys can, can talk about this, but much better than I, but he notices that there are several critical blank theory courses in the Harvard curriculum. And what they all do is to look at a certain facet that creates a body of law around it. And none, frankly, I don't think there is a facet that has created more law around it than race. And, and so he creates critical race theory as a way to understand laws in the United States and patterns. That's what critical race theory was. Um, a, a Republican operative, Christopher Ruf, Rufalo, um, Rufo, saw, came upon the name, decided that the name was enough of a boogeyman that he would attach it to, to what he did not like that was going on in terms of the trainings that were uh, anti-racism trainings in, in the workplace. And some people went overboard with them, but I'm sorry, you can't go overboard, over, over more overboard than 400 years. So um, even if it was a little bit more than you wanted, believe me, you know, it pales next to what we're really talking about. He then starts to write about it under the guise of critical race theory. It's picked up uh, by someone who then the Trump administration hears about it, and he, and when Rufo is on a TV show, he then is invited to come to the White House, and the madness proceeds from there. That's how propaganda is done. 
So as a result of that, you have teachers who are now unable to teach certain areas because they're terrified that they are going to be, in, in the case of, of um, Florida, under Florida law, they can now be criminally prosecuted because of that law. Yes, read the law, you'll see. All right. So oh. it, it's, it's going to be a very difficult thing, but people are going to have to marshal together to make sure that that kind of suppression and frank censorship is not allowed to, to be victorious. It's endangering everybody. It, it, the potential, that's why I mentioned the um, Daughters of the Confederacy curriculum, because the potential is there to do the same thing. And that's really what they would like to do. Janice, I've got a question for you, if I may. If I'm remembering correctly, be before you got your doctorate, you got a master's, and your master's was, I believe, in black studies. Am I right? And you were perhaps Thank the you. first, if not the, <laughs> the very you first, hear, maybe? You hear Steve prodding. <laughs> 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 My master's degree is the nation's first graduate degree in black studies. Mills College, Oakland, California, MA70. Um, it, is, it came about because in 68, right across the bay at San Francisco State, a woman who's a dear friend now, but um, Sonia Sanchez, the poet and um, professor, was at San Francisco State and students were really up in arms. The Black Panthers had just begun in 66 in Oakland, California. Two young college students tired of being roughed up by the police. That's the climate that's going on, 66 to 68. And the students at San Francisco State are saying, we need something else by way of education. Relevance is the, is the word that was the watchword of the day. My, I was invited, literally, to, to recruit it, to be a student at Mills College, thinking they thought at the time that I would be their first black graduate student. It turns out that I was the second, but the second in 118 years. And um, when I was actually there, thanks, Dave. Um, Mills College is where Dave also attended. Um, college and uh, graduate school. He studied composition with um, Darius Mio, and you know one of his sons is named Darius. And I studied composition as a pianist with um, Darius Mio, and uh, many years later, and decided though in the midst of all that was going on that I needed something that would be relevant in an entirely different way to me. And I asked Mills, with their tradition of independent study, if I could um, take, make the subject of my master's um, black studies, and they said yes. And so my master's in 1970 becomes um, the first graduate degree in black studies. And you were. <laughs> Janice, if, if I'm remembering correctly, you were a neighbor of the Brubecks, were you not, in your time living here? I lived, when I lived on Nod Hill Road, they lived at the adjacent, right down the street. And um, those, some of you may know, some don't know, my husband was the musician Max Roach, whose papers are now at the Library of Congress. And um, he and Dave, knew each other very, very well, and um, sometimes hatch it in each other's back until they decided to pull it out. And, um, <laughs> and uh, so I knew Dave and Iola that way as well. And I was looking at the piano because the very last time I saw Dave, um, he was at the piano in his living room on that side street. So. Yes. Oh, it's very touching. Other questions? Yes, we have one. Just a second, we're going to get you a microphone. Oh, sorry. There you go. Um, may I ask, Dr. Adams, what we can do? Is our first port of call writing to senators, or would you recommend something more Wait effectual? a minute. We have a newly elected official in the room. <laughs> <laughs> see, see more. 
we we I'm said sorry, I... we said we were going to celebrate the fact that you were newly elected. <laughs> <laughs> I know I didn't say I was going to put you on the spot, but no, I'm so um, sorry. I was I was showing something to my neighbor here. I... <laughs> yes, I was just asking what Dr. Adams would recommend. What can we do to help the situation? Should we write to our senators, or is there something May more effective? May I frame that question in just a little bit of a way? Because I don't know what your specific area is, but I know that the phrase is cast down your bucket where you are. And so I would ask, in the area that you focus on and in your representation as a newly elected official, what would be most helpful for you at the point where you are for so, us to do? So since you've given me the mic, um, <laughs> my, uh, and thank you, my um, areas right now are I am the chair of children's and the vice chair of the um, higher education and employment advancement. So what that means is I get to be present during the screening meetings of bills and get to give it, you know, sort of the push ahead or perhaps, you know, in certain instances you don't want some of the bills that are coming through. And so um, in higher ed, one of the things that I've focused on is transcripts and the fact that if a student, and I know this from my experience of running person to person, if a student gets started in college and then runs out of money. They cannot get a transcript and continue in college until they've paid their debts. But if they have no money, they can't pay their debts, so they're completely kept from moving forward with their education. So that bill is going to come forward, and I would love it if anybody would um, give public testimony to it, because more often than not, these are students who are black and brown students, students who are not who are, have less money, and it means that they are completely forestalled at the beginning of their education when they run out of money. So in all instances, if you pay attention, and sign up for my, go online, sign up for ccmar.com, mayors, or Senator CCMAR, and I'll send you my newsletter. Public hearings are very important. Even if you can't sit and give public hearings, if you can provide testimony on the bills that you believe in, so if you believe in a bill, and if you pay attention, read Connecticut Mirror, read Connecticut Insider, that's where all the news is about all the bills, and then testify or put in testimony. And if there's something that you don't think is being talked about enough, then write your senators. And I mean all 20, or 36 of them, not just me. Just put a, a thing out. I get emails all the time from people who are concerned about bills. And it's good because it means that's what people care about. And that's what we want to know is what they care about. So, um, I mean, justice is incredibly important to me. And the fact that we do undo, we can't undo. But we move forward from the 400 years, that is really important. So any ideas, I'm all ears. Thank you. I'm going to ask the library, and the, the, from the library standpoint, I mean, we have political pressures being exerted on libraries and on historical societies in certain parts of the country. And, and let's not be complacent. It's not just those parts of the country by those people. It's happening everywhere, and people who you thought would never do some of this are doing some of this. So I ask, you know, as, as the director of the library, oh, that's right, did you see my <laughs> newsletter last week in tribute? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it, it's, it's a more fun conversation, a tribute that I wrote to the libraries and to the Wilton Library in particular from when my daughters were little. But, but, um, but even though you're here in Wilton, I'm sure you get some people who have come in and who have objected because that's what people are doing. What do we need to do to protect our libraries? Libraries as wonderful as this one, and I know this library when it was about one third the size. <laughs> um, thank you, yeah. Um, it has 
thankfully not happened in this library yet. It has happened in the schools in Walton, in their libraries. Um, so we, we're being as proactive as we can in terms of getting our policies ready, making sure our staff and board know what to do in those situations. And we would just ask for you know, the community support if you do see an issue rise you know, up into Good Morning Wilton or one of our local papers that you would just support us. Um, it's a very real problem in Stanford. You know, they did get some death threats for doing certain kinds of programs. So it's definitely not just in certain parts of the country and it's really unfortunate, but currently we do feel supported, so thank you. Yeah. I, I would suggest that one of the main things mm -hmm. to do when you ask that question, and I'm so glad you did, is really to kind of work with a group of friends and colleagues to see how you protect this library and then begin to model out um, and, and find a way just like other people who who have who are of more nefarious intent are doing that on their end and and it has to be done on the positive side as well. I mean one of the things that they forget is that if people had if everybody had been the way they they were they'd have no library to come to to complain. <laughs> Janice on that note I believe um, if there are no other questions we're going to say a very special thank you to you for giving us, from the heart, a very, very special thank you. Thank you, everybody. There. <laughs> this series continues next week with the speaker who's going to take us on from Brown v. Vortabad through to the current era with special focus on the role of children. There is a reception right out here. Glory Dave books are available if you'd like to get a copy of uh, one of the books that Dr. Adams wrote. And again, our special appreciation to you, Janice, for being here with us and Thank taking the so time much. to do that. Thank you, Wilton.